Welcome to Creating Wealth with Jason Hartman. During this program, Jason is going to tell you some really exciting things that you probably haven't thought of before and a new slant on investing. Fresh new approaches to America's best investment that will enable you to create more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made, multi-millionaire who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. He's been a successful investor for 20 years and currently owns properties in 11 states and 17 cities. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to financial freedom. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show. This is episode number 230, and this is your host, Jason Hartman. Thanks so much for joining us today. As you regular listeners know, every 10th show, we do a non-financial topic, but it always relates back to finance and success in life in some way. And we are doing that again today, of course, because this is show number 230. I've got Sarah here with me. How are you doing, Sarah? Good. Hi, Jason. How's it going? Good. And we're going to talk about a couple things, but the first thing I wanted to touch on before we get to today's guest is talk a little bit about my comments last week when I talked about my very swanky new penthouse here in Arizona in the greater Phoenix area and talk about rent elasticity because that's really what that whole subject was about and it's very important for us as investors to understand and exploit these little holes and loopholes in tax law, in pricing, in imperfections of pricing in markets, and and all of those types of things can really, really benefit us. You know, you've heard me talk about it before, but the concept of embracing the fragmentation, and th- and that's one of the things I love about the income property, the real estate business. It's very fragmented. It's a very imperfect market. You have many different disparate players, and they all do things a different way way and it makes it impossible for big hedge funds to institutionalize it and do it very well. That's what keeps Goldman Sachs out of our business and what keeps the opportunity there for us. But you also see these imperfections in pricing, whereas the commercial real estate market, although you know you can wheel and deal in that market as well, I would say generally speaking, it's less so than the residential side of the real estate market because it's more fragmented less professional, and there are just all kinds of little loopholes in pricing and in markets. So this also applies to the concept of rent elasticity. And last week, I offered kind of an informal challenge just as I was talking to you. I just thought of it right there off the top of my head as as so many things happen that way. And that was to have you guess my rent, because I think it's such an incredible deal First of all, not living in the Socialist Republic of California. That's why so many people are leaving states like that with big government, with intrusive government, states that aren't business friendly. But also, when you're renting a high-end property, it's better almost always to be a renter from just a purely rent-to-value ratio standpoint. Of course, there are other considerations, family, so forth. I get that. But when you're renting a lower-end property, it's almost always better to be an owner of that property. So if you want to participate in this silly little contest, it'll be kind of fun. And all you have to do is guess what my rent is. Now, if you were at the last Meet the Masters event, I disclosed what my rent is. So you can't play. Sorry about that. (laughs) because because you were there and you heard me talk about it before. But just go back and listen to show number 229, and here's what you get. The three closest guesses will get free tickets to our Creating Wealth Boot Camp that is on January 7th in Phoenix, and we'd love to have you at that event. And here's what's special about this Creating Wealth event. We've never done it quite this way before. So what I always say is you should always come to the events on a repeated basis because there's always new information. And even if some of the information is a repeat, you'll always hear something new. And I'll never forget the way Earl Nightingale, the late, great Earl Nightingale, explained this to me many, many years ago. And this is why it's so important when listening to the podcast that you listen repeatedly, not just to all the new shows and all the old archived shows, both on the website at jasonhartman.com or on iTunes, but also in the members only section, the exclusive content that we've got there. And the reason is this is what happens with your mind. And today on this show, on this 10th show, we're going to be, our guest is going to be talking about the way our mind works. So 
here's one thing I want to tell you, and this I learned from Earl Nightingale many years ago, and here it is. If you picture an old-fashioned record player, well, what does it have? It, ha it has a turntable, right? And so you've got the record on the turntable, and then there's the tone arm or the needle, right? And the needle drops on the record to read the grooves in the record and then turn that into sound for us, right? Well, that's the way a good old-fashioned record player works. If you look at it as a CD, well, what's reading it? A laser is reading it, but it's being read. Well, what happens when you hear something that is of particular interest to you, to your mind, when your mind hears that, it's as if you're picking up that tone arm or picking up that needle off the record and the record keeps spinning under it and you miss, your mind misses everything that was said immediately after that interesting thought. So that's why when you listen to audiobooks, podcasts, or you attend seminars, even if it's the exact same thing over and over as it is with a podcast or an audiobook or any recorded information, you still learn something new because your mind has already heard and analyzed and evaluated the interesting thing that was of interest to you the first time, and now you're ready to listen to all the stuff that your mind is now perceiving and remembering and analyzing and processing all the stuff that came behind each of those little interesting bits and bites or tidbits. And so that's why it's so important to immerse yourself in this content on a repeated basis. But here's what's so special about this Creating Wealth boot camp that we have on January 7th in Phoenix, is that since it's in one of our markets, our Phoenix market, you will have the opportunity to look at properties and tour properties as well. So the event is all day on Saturday, January 7th, but on the Friday or the Sunday, you will have the opportunity to meet with our local market specialists and look at properties. Or if you don't want to look at properties necessarily, just the opportunity to sit down with them face to face, talk to their management team, talk to their people, and really learn all about that. So it'll be a, a, a really valuable Creating Wealth Bootcamp. Even if you've attended before, you'll want to attend this one, again, as a re-audit of the content, but also so that you can look at properties in the greater Phoenix market. I think that'll be a big opportunity for you. Sarah, don't you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I think it's a great idea to be able to, you know, meet face to face with a team that you're going to be working with. And, and, and just to chime in on, you know, the repeat content idea. Uh, it's so true. I mean, I've sat through your seminar. I listened to the podcast, believe it or not. <laughs> you, you have, you have been to my seminars almost more than I have. <laughs> you're, you're, a, you're a very good student <laughs> like that. I got to compliment you on that because even though you hear it over and over, you're always sitting at the back of the room listening and learning. So that's really good. Well, and I truly do pick up something new each time. And, you know, even if it's not new content, you have your mind wraps around it in a different way, depending on where you're at in your investment horizon. So it's great content. It really, you know, reiterates that, you know, real estate is the best place to be. It makes you feel like you're you're doing the right thing. And it also makes you feel like, you know, you know, more about real estate than most of the rest of the world. So I felt really privileged during that last master's weekend just to be sitting in that room soaking up all that information. Yeah, well, you know, that's a that's actually a, another good point that you bring up is that you, you, you mentioned something that, that it makes you feel like you're more knowledgeable, right? But see, right. you know, that oddly enough, that may seem like a really sort of soft comment, like not a hard thing, a hard comment, it, a, a sort of a soft comment, but it's really not. You know why? Because because I was talking with one of our burgeoning investors last night, and this person who I was speaking with has not invested yet and really wants to. It's just been so enamored of our content, loves the podcast, etc. But it's kind of like until you really jump in and do something you you just don't really get it. One of my favorite quotes is a, is a good old Zen quote. It's a quote from Zen, and it is this, to know and not to do is to not yet know. And when I hire people in, in the businesses I've had over the years, I honestly find that the best training is the on-the-job training. And there is no better way to learn how to do income property investing than to just actually do it. And, and the way you get the confidence to just actually do it, the steps leading up to that point are to attend the events over and over, to be listening to the podcast over and over, and, and be attending live events too. So that's where that, that comes from. So 
great points there. So here's the contest. Win yourself. Now there's two free tickets for each winner. We're going to have three winners and whoever's the close, the three closest guesses on my rent. Okay. <laughs> it's just kind of now, a funny thing. Jason, uh, is are that, the winners. Okay. Is go that ahead. three, is that three closest without going over? <laughs> uh, no, you could go over or under three okay. closest either way. So if you're a dollar over or a hundred dollars over or a thousand dollars over or under, we're just going to pick the three closest. So could, could be either side of, of the over or under equation, okay? And so here's the deal. Just you, you have to go back and listen to the intro of show number 229, the last show, and hear the description of my very swanky new penthouse and guess the rent. I think you'll be pretty amazed. And this is a, this is a study in rent elasticity. My point here is why it's such a good deal to rent a high-end property and rent low-end properties to other people, okay, is because there is very little elasticity in rents. And so renters will only pay up to really a certain point. After that, the property just becomes such a fantastic deal because the RV or rent-to-value ratios are so in favor of the renter when it's a high-end property, whereas a low-end property, they're much more in favor of the owner. And this is why high-priced markets don't make sense for us as investors. So, Sarah, what else do we have to talk about? Any big questions or burning issues that our clients are facing that they've been talking to you about over the past week or two that you want to share? Oh, boy, you put me on the spot here. I did put you on the spot with that. Well, <laughs> you know what? Let me, let me let you think about that for a moment while I talk to the listeners about what is covered at the Creating Wealth Boot Camp, okay? So, again, folks, you can probably tell. I, I have to tell you, Sarah, this is funny. One person wrote me an email, a listener, uh, a while ago. This was about maybe a year and a half ago and said, I love your show. It's so, so insightful and so great. And folks, I love those comments. So keep them coming. They really make me feel like what we're doing is very worthwhile. So thank you, all of you supporters out there for, for all the kind words. But they said, you know, <laughs> you must spend just an, a, a crazy inordinate amount of time preparing for the show. And the fact is, I don't. <laughs> but Jason I guess literally it, called me and said, "Hey, you want to record a podcast?" An intro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But what I really do is I my preparation is my whole life. You know, I live this every day. I'm always reading and digesting this kind of material. And sometimes I'll, uh, I'm listening to other people's shows as well. And some of you listeners give me some recommendations like someone, and forgive me, I can't remember who it was, told me to listen to the Cato Institute podcast. And I've been listening to that one and I find it pretty interesting. And my preparation is that I live this all day long every day. So that's the preparation for the show. But let's talk about the Creating Wealth event just for a moment while Sarah's thinking about my, my put her on the spot question there. What will this event include, the boot camp? This is our fundamental course. We have had thousands and thousands and thousands of people come through this course over the years. And we've been doing it since, I think our first one was in 2004. And of course, it's changed with the times. It always has to. But this is our fundamental work. If you have been to Meet the Masters, I commend you. You have my compliments. I mean, that is a great event. However, it is not a foundational event. And at one time, I really wanted to make it so that there would be a prerequisite before you can attend Meet the Masters, you have to attend creating the Creating Wealth Boot Camp. And you know what? I tried to do that, and frankly, it just didn't work. I just couldn't get people to do it. And so you can attend whichever one you want in whichever order. But the Creating Wealth in Today's Economy Boot Camp is our foundational event. It's where you get all of the foundational principles and philosophies upon which our thinking lies. And I know if you're a listener to this show for any length of time, you know that our philosophy and our methodology and our strategies for investing are totally unique. I mean, you really just don't hear them anywhere else. We have really distilled some very unique ideologies that at least I have never heard anywhere. They are truly original thought. Now, they're not, not everything is original thought. Of course, there are some timeless principles that, you know, I've learned from everybody dating back to Bill Nickerson and his book about how he turned, what was that book called? <laughs> how I turned $1,000 into a million dollars at part-time in real estate or something like that. It's a classic. It's an old book. But those are woven into this, of course. But so we, we go over the, the way to move from active to passive income, 
Of course, we go over in depth the 10 commandments of successful investing. We talk about leverage, how it works for you, how it works against you, and how really it doesn't always really work against you anyway, but most people think it does. We talk about how to understand true ROI and the four different major components of ROI or return on investment and what else return on inflation. We look at some historical appreciation data for U.S. properties. Oh, we go through a sample portfolio makeover that we'll take you through. We go over the refi till you die methodology. We talk about the different governmental, fiscal, and monetary issues that affect us and, and really benefit us as investors. We talk about how the government is in such a mess and how the government will react to the mess it finds itself in. And when I say it, that means we, because we are the government, but we're not the elite class. So we have to learn how to defend ourselves against that elite class. We'll talk about the refi till you die scenario. What is your seven-year plan? What is your 12-year plan? Gosh, there's just so much in this. It's like a whirlwind day. It is it is just packed with information. And I tell you, by the end of these, I'm basically the speaker for pretty much all of this event. So this is the event that tires me out. I love it, but it, it gives me an exhilarating sense of of exhaustion, okay? But I'm the speaker for virtually all of this event. I'm taking you through all of it personally. And whereas at the Meet the Masters event, I'm sort of the MC. You know, I'm not really the speaker. I We call in experts and they do all the heavy lifting and all the speaking. So that event's kind of an easy one for me, frankly, because most of the speaking is done by other people. We're going to talk about, of course, one of my favorite topics, inflation and deflation. And we're going to talk about parsing up the various elements of a product and how they react to asset deflation and monetary inflation. We're going to talk about some reports in some various magazines and publications, Time Magazine, U.S. News and World Report. We're going to talk about something I call the double inflation arbitrage. We're going to talk about stages of your wealth building plan. And we'll talk about the risk evaluator, the thing that it took me 19 years in this business to discover. And it was a discovery. It was not an invention. But I think I discovered something that I have never heard anyone else talk about in the countless seminars I've been to, the countless books I've read on the subject, and it is my own thinking on how to really, really reduce and almost eliminate risk. I can't say completely eliminate because there's always risk in everything, risk when investing in income property. So I'll teach you about that risk evaluator and that aha moment that happened 19 years into my career that I think is very, very unique. We'll talk about constructive versus decent destructive debt and how to make sure you're on the right side of that equation. We'll talk about the three dimensions of income property investing and really a whole lot more. So Sarah, you asked me to mention that because people want to know what we're going to cover on January 7th at our right. Creating Wealth event in Phoenix. So there we go. Yep. So I had a second to think about, you know, what questions people are asking me these days. And so right. I'm ready. Go for it. Go for <laughs> so, it. So, well, you know, I was thinking about how, you know, we've had a lot of new investors call in. We've got some radio ads going. And so I've been talking to a lot of people that are kind of newer to our network. Right. And those and, are on, by the way, just so you know, folks, those are on the Sirius XM satellite network, mostly on CNBC and Bloomberg, because we want to be where the financial people are listening, but we don't want them going down the road of Wall Street because Wall Street, we know, is the nothing more than the <laughs> modern version of organized crime. <laughs> the modern version of organized crime, we call it Wall Street. Anyway, Sarah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, and the one question I always get is, you know, well, it's first, you know, what do you do? And then the other question is, well, you know, what can you do for me? You know, if you say, if you recommend invest in Dallas, you know, why wouldn't I I just go to Dallas on my own and, and find a property. So, you know, I sort of explained to them how we're area agnostic. And I just kind of want to talk a little bit about that today, because it's important for our investors to know that we're in this every day. We are constantly talking to our local market specialists, our lenders, our property managers, but more importantly, our actual investors that are doing this every day. And so I know, you know, if there are any, you know, red flags with a property manager, or I know what's going on that's good in a market and why you should maybe choose this market over another market, 
depending on where you're at with your investments. And so I can I can talk to the newer investors about what's really going on. And it's so hard to know when you first go to our website, you know, well, where do I start? I, you know, Dallas looks great. Miami looks great. Well, you know, depending on when you talk to me, I may have some insightful information about a market that, you know, may steer you to or away from a market. That's a great point you're making, Sarah, because it's a dynamic thing. It's always changing. We've done business in, I think, now 40, 45 markets, I believe. I haven't counted lately, but 45 different cities around the United States. And at any given time, and lately, really, we've been kind of in the same markets for a couple of years now, really, I'll say since the financial crisis, we, we've we sort of stuck with a core of maybe 10, 12 markets that we're mainly recommending. But it's always changing. The inventory is always changing. And that's what I just want to say again, because many people read stuff and they think, oh, this is a great market or that's a great market, Atlanta, Phoenix, whatever, right? And and that may be true, but the question is not just is the market the right market. The question is, do you have good inventory there? Do you have a strong local market specialist there that has good follow through, that keeps their promises, that does what they say they're going to do, that delivers on their promises? And, you know, I'll tell you, that is always changing. So it's not just about the market, it's about the relationships. And the the advantage you have with us that you will never have on your own and you will not have with most other groups out there is the fact that we do such a high volume of business. And frankly, and this may sound braggadocious, but we have such a stellar reputation. And I know we do because believe me, I'm paying attention to that. We have such a good reputation and so much leverage with these vendors that they do right by our clients by and large. I'm not saying there's never a problem. There are problems. But compared to the horror stories I hear about other groups out there, (laughs) believe me, you want to be hitching your wagon to a star that's been established for a while and who has a large volume of business who is in this for the long haul like we are. Well, and and don't get me wrong, you know, I have good relationships with our market specialists, but, you know, our loyalty is to the clients and, you know, we want our market specialists and property managers to do right by the clients. And so, you know, if I see something or I, I hear something that doesn't sound right or sounds like we could make it better, I do my best to call them out on it and, you know, help improve situations in every way that we can. And, you know, I'm not afraid to hire and fire property managers. If I find a property manager that can do a better job, I will. And I think my, our investors will attest to that. So, um, you know, and one other, one other quick point about this is when you go and, and you talk to, and, and I keep using Dallas as an example, I don't know why, that just pops into my brain. But Use, You know what I kind of like right now? I kind of like Atlanta at the moment. I'm, I'm sort of partial, like if you ask me today, I'm I'm into Atlanta at the moment. I think we're getting some really good inventory there. But yeah, go ahead. So Well, I'm partial to Atlanta too. I mean, that's where my husband and I just bought. So right. yeah. <laughs> But you know, if if you go and you buy you want to buy in Atlanta and you talk to maybe a local agent there and then you talk to, you know, our market specialist there, you're gonna hear all the great things about Atlanta. You're gonna hear everything that they want you to hear. But when you call me, I'm gonna be you know, give you the other side of the story if there is one. And, you know, I'm also going to point out, I'm going to point out the benefits and I'm going to point out maybe some downsides so that you can make, you know, the most educated decision based on what you're looking to do and what your investment goals are. And that varies for every investor. Every investor is in a different place in their investment timeline. So yeah, absolutely. And and you know what? The reason we do that is because we're area agnostic. Another big mistake I see investors making is that they're going to certain groups that are out there marketing who are just in one market. That is the dumbest thing any investor can ever do. You want to go to an impartial area agnostic source. We're not just offering properties in Atlanta or Dallas or Phoenix. We're offering properties in a lot of different places so we can afford to move around and put the client in the stuff that makes sense. You never want a one-trick pony. Would you go to a stockbroker who only sells one stock or one mutual fund? Of course not. That would be like going to the mutual fund company directly. That wouldn't make sense at all. You're never going to get any impartial objective advice unless you're dealing with someone who's area agnostic, and and that's what we are. So very good point. Okay, Sarah, anything else real quickly, or should we go on to today's guest? Because remember, this is a 10th show, and we're not supposed to talk about 
financial stuff too much. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, so sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, I'm happy to answer anybody's individual questions. You can always call in or, or email us. Um, if you're looking for some one on one consultation, you can always go to our website and complete our investor questionnaire. And to get to that questionnaire, it's just uh, jasonhartman.com forward slash IQ. And as soon as we get that questionnaire, um, we will certainly get in touch with you and to help you personalize your own portfolio. That's a good way to put yourself at the top of the list because the people that fill out the questionnaires, we know they are the more serious clients. So definitely recommend that you do that. But you know what? We didn't tell you how to enter the contest. It's real easy. You just go to jasonhartman.com slash contact, jasonhartman.com slash contact. And you just fill out that little contact us form. And in the comments, just put, say, I think Jason's rent is and put the number. So if you think it's $10,000 a month, or you think it's $8,000 a month, or $12,000 a month, or $3,000 a month, or whatever you think the number is, just put it in the comments section, and the three closest winners get a free ticket to the Creating Wealth Bootcamp in Phoenix on January 7th. And we will look forward to seeing you there. I hope all of you listeners can make it. Well, that would be a little large. Don't all come. We'd have to rent a stadium. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, I hope a good number of you come. And thank you so much for listening. And we will be back with our guest in just a moment on this 10th show, where we're going to talk about how our mind works and how we can use our brain more effectively. Sarah, thanks for joining me today, too. And listeners, we'll be back in 60 seconds with our guest. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com. Or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. It's my pleasure to welcome Hannah Holmes to the show. She is the author of four books and an expert on humans, nature, and human nature. She has written some great sort of tongue-in-cheek work in her different titles and has looked at the world with new eyes, things that we take for granted and, and that seem very obvious to most of us. Hannah has a very, very interesting perspective on, so I'm sure you'll like this talk with her today. Hannah, welcome. How are you? Great. Wonderful to be here. Well, good. Good to have you. So your latest work is entitled Quirk. Tell us about that and what you learned about uh, humans and human nature in, in writing that one. Well, here's the deal. You look around and you see all these people whose personalities are not like yours. And the natural response is, why not? It would be so much better if everyone were like me. And the problem is, if everyone were like you, we would all have the same response to the risks and the opportunities that naturally come our way. And that simply doesn't work in an unpredictable world. So what we find, not just in humans, but in all animals, is that personality is the variation in how we respond to the crazy stuff that nature throws at us. So nature throws, you know, a fantastic opportunity out. And some people are afraid of it, and they avoid taking risks to grab it. And others are unafraid, and they grab it. There are drawbacks and benefits to each approach, and they really are complementary, and we have to have that diversity of personality in order to survive. And to keep people interested in all the different things we need to do to create our economy, too, you know, and all the specialization of, of labor and so forth. So, yeah, very interesting. You know, how does our brain chemistry, though, dictate our personality? I, and, and, and is it not just, is it chemistry only or is it actual structural? I mean, if you look at the brains of males and females, the, the structure is different to some extent, right? Right. The genes that make up your personality, and there are probably many thousands of them that, that go into personality, these genes dictate oftentimes how active a certain part of your brain will be. In other words, you might have a super active amygdala. Mine tends to be on the, you know, that runs kind of hot. It's always looking for danger. And so in my brain, when there's any indication 
occasion of trouble, my amygdala is going to ramp up pretty quickly. But then the next person who takes things a little less seriously, it's going to be kind of a quiet amygdala. And maybe their prefrontal cortex is online just sort of analyzing the possibilities. So it's real, what, what we really see is differences in the activity level in the various modules that make up the brain. And this is probably thanks to the fMRI, right? The functional MRI machines now that we have. And we, we can really tell what people are thinking. It's almost like mind reading. It's pretty amazing nowadays. It's very cool because psychologists used to have to rely on us to tell the truth about our personality. So they would just rely on questionnaires. And those are still valuable. But obviously, we all want the world to think well of us. And so this comes out in questionnaires. We try to make ourselves look, you know, sane when perhaps we're a little too neurotic or a little too impulsive and extroverted. So they're actually finding that by comparing our answers to questionnaires and then the MRI, which watches our brain respond to various things, they're getting a much more honest answer out of the MRI machines. Of course they are, yeah. So you said that your amygdala is active. First of all, what is the amygdala? And does that make you a thrill seeker? Do you like to bungee jump and do crazy things like that? Oh, contraire. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, after you. The amygdala is it's an ancient part of the brain, and most of the personality regions are very, very old, and they're shared by all animals. So the amygdala is this tiny little piece, sort of dead center, deep in your brain. And it's the emergency, um, sort of emergency detection system. It is constantly scanning data that comes into your brain through the senses for signs of danger. And if there is a sign of danger, the amygdala sort of coordinates an emergency response. And some people's are set on, you know, oh my God, and others are set on, eh, who cares? And we all have the amygdala, but it's just a, the degree to which you're neurotic or anxious or laid back depends on how active your amygdala is. And that's a genetically determined element of your personality. But, you know, if you look at it from an evolutionary perspective, I mean, seeking danger is, as the, na as the word would imply, it's dangerous, right? Why, why would someone seek danger that would weed them out of the gene pool potentially, right? Well, absolutely. But there are risks to every personality type. If you think in terms of the environment we grew up in, our species evolved in, you know, millions of years ago, before we had excellent shelters, think of us as, as squirrels and the economics that a squirrel has to navigate in order to eat. The squirrel has to come out of the shelter of the tree and go out into the middle of the lawn in order to eat. And that exposes him to a potential cost, which is the hawk overhead. So the squirrel is always balancing opportunity versus risk. And that is exactly how humans evolve, too. And we maintain all the brain chemistry to work that math. But some of us are set on, don't go into the middle of the lawn for an acorn if there's a kind of mushy, nasty, old, sour one that you could survive on for another day without leaving the shelter of the tree. So that's the don't risk anything response. Others are set on, go, go, go out in the middle, go even further. There might be something really awesome there. And then maybe you could like move to the next tree where things are better. So it's a more exploring, short-term opportunity personality. Yeah, I, I agree with you there, but the, some of the thrill seekers aren't doing it for opportunity other than I guess the opportunity is the actual thrill itself and the endorphins, right? It's not for a survival opportunity or a monetary opportunity. They just seek thrills for thrill's sake. There are two um, responses to that. One is that we've created for ourselves an environment that has a huge number of ways to kill ourselves. And so this normal drive to experience thrills, which evolved to push people to push our boundaries, to explore and find new opportunities. Now there are so many opportunities to seek thrills and, you know, in the process, behead yourself that it's a lot more dangerous to be a thrill seeker these days. On the other hand, we can see in the genetic record of humans how that thrill seeker mentality has served us. There's a particular gene, it's a dopamine gene, and dopamine is the sort of go forward, the extrovert, the impulsive, the ADHD system that's all about looking outward for opportunities. And there's a particular form of this gene that we find really enriched in populations of risk takers today, but also in populations that have migrated around the globe further than any others. So if you look at a population in, say, deep in South America, those people had to basically walk there 
and they tend to have more of this go for it explorer gene. And likewise with financial risk takers, same exact version of the gene. It's a gene that says, take opportunities and don't just wait for them, go and find them. And it pays off in the long run. So, so is that to say that the person who takes the risk and seeks opportunity does better in life? Or, or does it, obviously, I mean, I know there's two answers to this, or does it pay to play it safe? Or, or does, you know, it reminds me of the quote, ships are safer in the harbor, but that's not what ships are built for. Well, the, the magic of this diversity of personality is that we come in all flavors. So on a bad day when it's really hard to find acorns, then it really pays off to have that risk-taking opportunity. You're not going to starve to death because you're motivated to go and look. On a really bad day when there are no acorns and you're anxious, you may starve because your anxiety prevents you from you know, getting in the ship and sailing over the horizon to see what's there. They complement each other beautifully because someone's always going to be keeping an eye on what's safest and most protective, and someone's always going to be sort of networking and reaching out for new opportunities. And the fact that we have this variation in our population, as do mice, again, is testimony to the fact that we need all these different responses or we would just be wiped out. Absolutely. So let's talk for a moment, Hannah. Well, first of all, before we talk about this, I want to ask you, in terms of scientists measuring a person's personality, are they doing it with the fMRI? Is that really the the gold standard or, or are there other ways that you want to talk about? There's a million ways to measure personality, and often people try to really focus on something tight so they know what they're measuring. So if you wanted to measure impulsivity, for instance, you could do that by watching the brain's response to various games. Or you could, uh, there's computer-based games where you can sit and answer questions. There was this this wonderful one called delayed discounting where you're offered a series of monetary options. One is, like, it'll start out with, would you rather have a dollar today or two dollars tomorrow? And then it moves up to more complex stuff. Would you rather have ten dollars in a week or a hundred dollars in a year? And this produces a really tidy graph of how impulsive you are. Really impulsive people will not wait for a reward. And really low impulsive people like me will wait, you know, I'll do the math and I will never leap before I look. So there are a million ways to test these things and and very specialized tests for each element of personality. Well, you talk about the five factors in your book. What are the five factors of personality? This is how psychologists have boiled us down. I mean, we're very complex, but they try to boil us down to these five factors, conscientiousness, openness to experience, extroversion, neuroticism, and agreeableness. And you can think of these as five dials on a stove, and you are the stove. And your personality is a combination of where each of those dials is set. So you might be high in conscientiousness and low in agreeableness and middling in extroversion and so on. And that's what makes us all a little bit different. Does it change? Do our, I mean, do our personalities change? Of course, they change situationally, I'm sure. But do they, do they change with age? I mean, can you teach an old dog new tricks? Really, because personality is so strongly genetic, it does not change much at all. You're essentially, you are who you are born to be. There's a few exceptions to that. You can change your personality on a temporary basis, as many of us do with drugs and alcohol, which actually does alter the balance between your sort of older, primitive, impulsive brain and your frontal lobe, which is sort of the CEO who tries to balance all the interests and be rational. Over the long haul, the one thing that does seem to change is that younger people are more impulsive and older people are less impulsive. And, you know, we know that just kind of from watching people age, but it is a measurable change. And it's really the only major factor that does change with age. People get more careful as they age because maybe they've had some bad experiences, right? (laughs) Well, it's even their bodies. You know, some of these tests measure your brain's impulsivity. So it's not even rational. It's just a slow decline in your impulsivity. And there are probably good biological reasons for that. It's, it's important for young people to take risks because their entire 
um, reproductive future hangs in the balance. One of my favorite studies recently is involved men crossing a street, not on a sidewalk, so jaywalking, and taking a risk with their physical safety. And men are more likely to do this, men of all ages, if there's a woman watching. And what that tells you is that males are willing to take some physical risk to advertise their strength and power, and, and theoretically, so that they can win more breeding opportunities. So we're all doing this stuff all the time, regardless of our age and and dignity, we're still motivated by these very ancient drives. Right. That's that's very interesting. You know, I want to get back to the dating and mating subject in a moment. But before we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about belief systems, if we can, Hannah. It amazes me, especially, I guess, in the political arena. And I have, I have long thought that Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals, literally just have different brain structures and different brain chemistries. Because they can't see eye to eye no matter how good or how sound an argument is for one position or the other. It just doesn't happen. Would you agree with that? Are are people wired a certain way? Are they physically, chemically made up to be, say, liberal or conservative? Absolutely. You know, there are people have been doing questionnaires on this forever and ever. But now, again, scientists are starting to use the more in the, the more um, imaging based ways of looking into it. So there's there's a couple important studies that have come out on the differences between the brains. One showed, well, this one used EEG, which is a little cap of electrodes you wear on your head. And you can watch what's happening in the person's brain. And they also were measuring the amount of sweat on the palm. And that's just a, it's a tiny little physical reaction that can tell what's happening with your emergency response system. And so they showed a bunch of people threatening images, images like guns and violence and sort of physically threatening images, and measured the sweat on the palms. What they found is that what I call the red brains, the more conservative brains, were really ramped up by images that were threatening. On the other hand, they've done some MRI with showing people images of people in pain. And in that case, they found that it's the blue brain, the the liberal, that fires up for images of pain. Our own pain center goes active when we see someone else in pain. Everyone's does. But the blue brains were much more empathetic on a biological level. What that tells me is that we're seeing a complementary role between the two where the, you know, think of us as, as these animals that evolved in small groups where anyone approaching your small group might be bringing a horrible disease for which there are no drugs, or they may be coming to kill us and take our territory or just kill the males and take the females, whatever. Strangers are bad, and they usually are in, in, in animal societies and, and probably in most of human history. So what it looks like is the red brain is tuned to protect that group of people, to maintain the uh, safety and security of the home group at all costs. And the blue brain is tuned to look for outside opportunities, to make sure that we still have some trade connections so we can get better tools, to make sure we can find fabulous, attractive young people for our people to mate with so that we don't become in a little gene swamp And the two are extremely complementary. One is keeping the group safe. The other is keeping the group vibrant over the long term by bringing in new ideas. Yeah, very, very interesting. So so diversity, nature likes diversity. I mean, obviously, genetically, we all know that you shouldn't marry your cousin, right? Uh, And certainly not your brother or sister. But that diversity of thought is a big part of nature, too, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, I found that kind of interesting, but then taking a few steps back, recognizing that all the science that's coming out of, um, you know, ecology says that the more plants you have in a swamp, the more healthy and vibrant and resilient that ecosystem is going to be. This has been a huge area of research because we're trying to restore some of the things that we've destroyed. And that's a a really strong signal that, that diversity is the source of strength. And it just, you know, it was kind of, in retrospect, kind of a duh moment when I, when I stood, stood back and thought about that in terms of personality. If we all threw ourselves on every opportunity that walked in the door, we'd all be, you know, killed by the 
metaphorical hawk or fox or whatever. And at the same time, if none of us went forward and took opportunities, we'd use up everything we had around us and all starve to death. So it becomes quite clear that, that you have to have a mixture. When you talk about opportunities, I just keep thinking of what I think wasn't like a great movie or anything, but it had a great lesson in it, and that is the comedy with Jim Carrey, Yes Man. And I just noticed in that, and I think it's true in one's life most of the time, that taking advantage of opportunities and kind of the, the old proverbial, just do it, go go for it, that mentality, I I, I just think that most of the time those people just have a better life when they take chances, you know, more often than not. And I don't know if you saw the movie. Did you by any chance with Jim Carrey? No, I don't remember it if I did. Yeah, it's fairly recent. And it was just, he just said yes to everything. He couldn't say no. That's the story. And he'd, he'd find himself saying yes to things. And then they, it seems like they wouldn't work out. But then fate twisted around and ultimately it did work out. Any thoughts on that again? I mean, you touched on that earlier, but it just seems like the people that that do more stuff and try more things, just usually things work out better for them. I could be wrong, but that's my perception of it. I think to some extent it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because there will be a subset of people, extroverts mainly, and people who are open to new experience, so high in O and E. These people are more inclined to take risks, but they're also higher in overall sort of energy and gumption, and so they are more likely to succeed. And when you look at the population of people we call entrepreneurs or venture capitalists, people who are sort of leaping for opportunities, they are a certain personality type. They're not a random selection of humans. They tend to be higher in conscientiousness, so they work hard even if no one's telling them to. They are higher in openness, so they are their mind is open to opportunity as opposed to sort of protecting what they've already got. And they're extroverted. They're, they're energetic and they're motivated by people and by experience. So it's not surprising that those people would end up being successful. What you don't see is the neurotic and agreeable people jumping in to start a new business because that's just not how they're, that just doesn't feel good to that personality type. And so they don't do it. And they wouldn't be suited for it. They wouldn't be successful. They're much better at managing than at creating. And they're more comfortable in that role of trying to keep people happy and motivated and cooperative. Right, right. They're the, they're like the team player type. Hey, you know, you've mentioned neurotic quite a bit because that's one of the five types. Do you want to define neurotic a little bit? Because I'm not, I, that might mean something different to everybody listening. Yeah, that neuroticism is essentially an avoidance orientation in the personality. And that doesn't mean, you know, someone who just doesn't want to deal with the world. It's avoiding risk. So, Elements of the neurotic personality are things like high in anxiety, which is really just a, a, a watchfulness for, for problems. Depression is an element of the neurotic personality, and that doesn't mean, you know, you're hospitalized major depression. It means that your energy level isn't really high. You're more of a watcher and a waiter. And again, we are so inclined to judge people uh, in this country based on their productivity and so the neurotic personality doesn't look all that productive and awesome and fun to hang around with. But it's a conservative, wait-and-see, cautious personality that will serve you well in the long term, just like every other type. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. You know, I want to ask you about culture, Hannah, and then a animal personalities just for a moment. But before we do that, is there anything else that you want to talk about in terms of the dating and mating thing? Personality types getting along in relationships and so forth. Like if I'm a, an extrovert or do I want to marry a neurotic? <laughs> I'll just, you know. Well, actually, that's a, a good matchup if, you, if the difference isn't too huge. Because you, you would really balance each other because the extrovert is all about short-term leaping before you look and, you know, let's have fun today. And the neurotic is all about, well, I don't think we should go on vacation this month because, you know, the mortgage is due and college bill is coming up. And, and so they really uh, balance each other. One has their eye on the long-term stability and the other has the eye on the short-term opportunities. And that's a nice, it can be a nice mix if, if people appreciate that about each other, and that's really the strength of understanding your personality is appreciating who you are, that it's not going to change, and that it certainly has benefits. 
So certainly that's a nice mix and match. Um, the only real research on this says that if you're really high in conscientiousness, do not mess around with somebody who is not because they will make you crazy. The whole point of that personality is finishing what you start and sticking to the hard work and not, you know, taking a two-hour, three-martini lunch. And if you're mated with somebody who does that, it's going to drive you nuts. Okay, yeah. What about culture? What does the role of culture play? I mean, you've got an American, which is a I think that's a personality type because it's sort of the rugged individual, the demand fairness, demand rights type of personality, which I, I think is great. I mean, I, I love that. But then it's very topical. I, I was in Japan a couple of years ago, and, and then, of course, we just recently had the terrible tragedy there. And you see the way the Japanese have handled themselves with such really dignity. I, I'm so impressed with the way they've responded to that and, and been so civil about it and, and so community-oriented. What's the difference sort of when you talk just about culture and the way it shapes personality? Well, if you start with the, the fact that about half of your personality is, is etched into your genes, that's your potential. And your environment has an opportunity to either sort of dampen your high points or expand them, allow them to grow to their full potential. And so what the role of culture is to sort of put parameters around how extreme a personality can be. And like you said, in, in, in America, we love extroverts. We love show-offs. We love confidence and go get them. So if you're born an extrovert in this country, you're, you know, you're halfway home. If you're born neurotic in this country, you might be considered, you know, kind of a, a milk toast, a weenie, a sissy, and so on. The Japanese culture, as you said, is completely inverse. The emphasis in that culture is on cooperation. It's not on individualism. It's on taking care of everyone and, and being fair. And so if you have a wildly extroverted personality in your genetic makeup in Japan, you'll find that you're not encouraged to express that through your behavior. So your personality isn't going to change. It's going to be the same. But your culture is always going to be saying to you, hush, pipe down, keep, you know, keep that to yourself. And you see that in the way that they respond to this, this um, terrible, terrible environmental situation where they're very restrained emotionally. They are not expressive. And if something like that happened in this country, we were, we're just so much more emotional. You would see a huge difference in how much we're allowed to express our personalities. So that's, that's the role of culture, is sort of putting limits on how you express the genes that make you who you are. Hmm. Yeah, okay, so, so it's nature and nurture, no doubt about it. We'll be back in just a minute. You know, Penny, sometimes I think of Jason Hartman as a walking encyclopedia on the subject of creating wealth. Well, you're probably not far off from the truth, Britch. Jason actually has a six-book set on creating wealth that comes with over 100 hours of the most comprehensive ideas on investing in business. They're in high-quality digital download audio format, ready for your car, iPod, or wherever you want to learn. Yes, and by the way, he's recently added another book to the series that shows you investing the way it should be. This is a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Jason actually shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets that are untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches us how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. He's recorded interviews with Harry Dent, Peter Schiff, Robert Kiyosaki, Pat Buchanan, Catherine Austin Fitz, Dr. Dennis Waitley, T. Harv Eker, and so many others who are experts on the economy, on real estate, and on creating wealth. And the entire set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered with a savings of $385. Now to get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series complete with over 100 hours of audio and six books, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you.
Talk about animals for a moment. I mean, I think my my dog has a tremendously interesting personality, <laughs> and I've always noticed that about animals. You say that mice have personality. I, I mean, how much personality does a mouse have? What, <laughs> what about animals? What's well, funny, biologists only in this century realize that animals have personality at all. I don't know how that happened. You know, anyone who's ever had two different animals. Well, I, I think Darwin wrote a book on that, didn't he? The Emotions of Animals or something like that? Yes, yes. And, but um, biologists somehow just always figured that if you've seen one lion, you've seen them all. I don't know how they failed to, to notice the variation in how animals respond, as we do, to opportunities or to risks. But now, fortunately, we do understand that. And so most of the drugs that we have for personality disorders, like anxiety disorders or schizophrenia or ADHD, these drugs have been created using mice because you can create mice who have ADHD or depression or anxiety um, or schizophrenia because their personalities are so identical to ours. They don't have all the nuance that a human has, but they have all the fundamentals, all those five factors you can find in a mouse. So two of the big chemicals that come up here are serotonin, and you've got the whole line of drugs like Prozac in that field. What do they call them? The uptake re-inhibitors, I think. And then dopamine. What roles do those play? Well, if you think of your basic animal as a tube with a mouth at the front that's sort of supposed to go and get things to keep it alive, what tells an animal which direction to go and what to eat? The system that informs everything from, you know, a starfish to a slug to a human is the dopamine system. And that dopamine system has evolved for each animal to tell it to go get things that are high in calories. If salt is limited in the environment, it tells them to go get salt. If it uh, obviously needs reproductive opportunities, and so the dopamine system points animals toward reproductive opportunities, Basically, if it feels good to you, your dopamine system is tuned to that and is saying, go get it, go get it, go get it, go get it. So that's dopamine. And when it goes wrong, you see addiction. And if you don't have enough of it, you're not very motivated to get the stuff that you need. So, so it, needs to, it needs to be the right balance, the dopamine balance, right? Like when you say addictions, you're talking about drug addictions? Yes. Well, any kind of addiction, gambling, food, anything, is if what what that is is the environment um, has hijacked the dopamine system and got it hooked on something that never was in our ancient environment. So a million years ago, our genes never saw, you know, southern comfort coming. We did not evolve surrounded by alcohol and meth and and poker games and so on. Now our environment is so full of stuff that's dangerous that the dopamine system is really challenged to steer clear of that stuff and not get hooked on it. Because that stuff is so powerful and, and we didn't, we, I mean, the ancient people though, they used alcohol and they ate berries and things like that that would make them feel, change their state, right? I mean, but, but they just weren't Absolutely. so powerful like they are today, right? Is that the difference? Well, they weren't as powerful, they weren't as common, so you couldn't go to a store you had to head out and for 99.9% of human history going out to get your food or your berries or your water meant you were walking past lions and alligators and mosquitoes that had malaria and all these risks that we have forgotten about there are no lions between me and the 7-eleven if I want a donut but most of our history we had to balance our desire to get high against the risk of heading out to find something that would do that. You know what I want to say about that is, and I think that's what's so dangerous about addictions, especially like drug and alcohol addictions, is that the person gets the rewarding feeling without doing any real work for it. And in the, in the olden days, they would have to do some real work for it. Of course, they'd have to balance the danger of going to get the berries or whatever, they, the work involved in creating the alcohol and distilling it and so forth. But nowadays, it just it comes too easily. And that's a very damaging thing, I think. We, we are a finely tuned animal that is finely tuned to find these sources of high calories and, and these other little chemicals that we need. Unfortunately, we have built for ourselves an environment that is too full of that stuff and it's too easy to get. So we maintain all the motivation and the drive to capture that stuff. But there's, as you said, there's no cost. 
biologists talk about this stuff in terms of economics. The cost of getting high on anything or even just getting food used to be extremely high. You had to spend calories walking around to find it, and then you had to risk your physical health by competing with other animals to get what you want. Now we have zero cost. When we, when we want something to soothe our dopamine, there's no cost to go getting french fries or cigarettes or a bottle of beer. So the, the economics of pleasure have changed in a way that is absolutely devastating for our brains. That's a very dangerous thing. So serotonin, you didn't address that one yet. Serotonin seems to be the social approach or avoid setting. And this is a system that can cause depression and anxiety when it's out of whack. And oftentimes those phenomena, the depression or the anxiety, are social responses. They're responses that move a person away from interaction with others. So serotonin seems to be a bit of a driver that keeps us in touch with others. And we are a social animal. We are really dependent on each other because we're, we are, again, so weak and pale and, and fleshy and unprotected. We need each other to survive. And serotonin seems to push us into proximity with others when perhaps deeper parts of our brains are saying, no, you know, people are dangerous and they can give you diseases and they want to eat your stuff and pick on you and that sort of thing. Serotonin may be the chemical that tries to hold us together. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I mean, those drugs like Prozac and so forth, there's a whole series of them. Th those are dangerous, aren't they? People have committed suicide on them, I've heard, and, and they're, they're not without their cost, it, it seems like. No drug is. The problem with these personality disorders is that personality is so complicated that um, if some, bio, some psychiatrists feel now that there are no two forms of depression that are the same in terms of what's going on inside your brain. So if you think about a personality that involves thousands of genes and, and many chemicals beyond serotonin, uh, dopamine and norepinephrine are also involved in depression disorders, it's kind of remarkable that we found drugs that work at all. The, the, the truth is that those drugs work in about half of people who need them, who need some sort of help, and the other half, no. So it's a, a fairly impressive thing that we've gotten as close as we have to figuring out how to treat these things, considering how complicated they are. But of course, if you aren't the brain type that those drugs work for, it's hard to predict what's going to happen when you put that into your head. And, and they can't tell in advance, can they? No, they can't. Not yet. Obviously, that's why we keep working with mice. That's why there are so many millions of depressed mice in the world, is that uh, researchers are always trying to improve the way we treat these disorders. Well, Hannah, this is this is fascinating. You know, I, I guess I have maybe one more question for you before you go. Men and women, the genders, the battle of the sexes. Assuming they're a male and a female that are the same, maybe the same level of each of those five personality types you described before. Are they still different in personality? Well, you're, <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially one week of the month, they're different. Well, okay. And, <laughs> and, and that, that raises the issue of, of hormones, which are tremendously influential on personality. The male, in general, is underwritten by testosterone, which informs his shape, his size, and, and a fair amount of how his brain works. And the female is underwritten by estrogen, and that determines her shape and size and a fair amount of her personality. So you don't actually see males and females with the same general personality type. Females, in general, are reliably more neurotic, which again is like anxiety um, and worry, and more agreeable. And males are reliably more extroverted. And you might think, why? What was that good for? But remember that again, for most of our history, the female got stuck with the job of cooking up babies and then carrying them around for a couple of years in the days before infant formula and play cribs, uh, you know, little play pens. So the entire fate of that kid was dependent on a female holding it for two, three, four years, either in or on her body. So it's a huge damper on her ability to feed herself, not to mention her child. And so females needed the assistance of other females. We couldn't do it alone. And so females have this completely different set of 
hormones and brain chemicals that allow us to be more sociable, more cooperative, more friendly. And you see that clear as day in the personality research. Just reliably, the female is more social and less aggressive. And the males did not have that burden of having to carry a child around and were free to be more independent agents and pursue their own interests. So you see more independent, uh, aggressive behavior from males. They simply didn't have the biological need to be as cooperative. And and males are generally, obviously, more risk-taking oriented and more opportunity oriented, whereas females are more safety oriented? Absolutely. And you see that from politics to investing decisions to who's going to get on a bike and ride it down a hill with no brakes. Absolutely universal. And of course, it comes down again to this reproductive issue. The female is taking risks for two, essentially. And so there's a considerable amount of breaking power in her brain that says, no, stay safe, stay safe, stay safe, don't risk. And the male has this really sort of short-term orientation when it comes to reproduction because their role is not necessarily one that takes years to fulfill. They do have the potential to just conceive a kid and then go to the next thing. And so a higher risk strategy does pay off for males. Yeah, and it pays off for everybody in a sense because there are more of us here today because of the way each gender is, right? Well, of course, it it always comes back to complementarity because if there were no females, it wouldn't matter how risky uh, or safe males were playing it. If females were all real risk takers, we would lose a lot more babies and, and... and a lot more pregnancies. Biologically, we're doing what what has worked for millions of years. Sometimes from our perspective in the 21st century, it looks a little odd. But when you think about how our species spent most of its history, we're really doing fine. Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. Just uh, one thought on that. Do you believe in that, the sort of the four-year theory? I don't know if there's a name for it, but it basically says that after the male and female conceive a child, that the male will have deep feelings of love and commitment for about four years, and then he starts to look around again. Because, you know, the theory being that that's the time that the woman really needs him to stick around because she's got to carry that kid, as you say. I'm not talking about in her uterus, but in her arms. And then the kid by age four is rather independent to some extent, and the female can get along better without the male. I'm sure you've heard about that evolutionary theory. Absolutely. And it makes a ton of sense not to traditional uh, religious thinking, which prefers that humans mate for life. But this is not what we see on the ground, so to speak. What um, what you often see is that a couple comes together uh, for one reproductive round, as you said, three, four, five years. And then it really benefits both parties to try mixing their DNA with a fresh batch from somebody else because it comes back to diversity. You don't know if you're putting your kids into a fabulous environment or a really tough environment. And so it always is a better bet to have each of your children with a different partner because that will be the most genetic diversity that you can produce, giving your genes the best chance of making it through the lottery. So we see this not just in males but in females that people start to shop around um, after a few years, a smaller version of that same effect is the few days when a female is super um, fertile. In the modern world, those few days are the days when a a modern American woman is most likely to go to a bar without her husband or boyfriend. It's when males find her most attractive just based on her photograph. It's a time when females will take more risks It's a very interesting phenomenon that we are still primed to look for opportunities when the stakes are the highest for the female. The female is on the hunt on those few days when she is fertile. When when she's ovulating. Yeah, you know, I I just saw a really interesting documentary that said that same thing. So that's that is fascinating. Hannah, this is fascinating, fascinating stuff. Tell people where they can get your book and give out your website so they can learn more. The website has everything on Earth, including the uh, USDA-approved 100% geeky scientist personality test, <laughs> on which a lot of you know, 
And a lot of research is based on it because it's, it's very tried and true. It'll take perhaps 20 minutes to go through it. So you can link to that through the website and figure out really what kind of mouse you are and what you're supposed to be doing. The website also has all of my books um, and links therein. The book Quirk is just out, and so it should be widely available unless your local bookstore has recently been converted to a nail salon, which is going around. I don't think Borders has the book because Random House won't send them any until they pay for the other ones. <laughs> yeah, I've heard so, about that in the bankruptcy. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, so the book is not available at Borders. It's uh tends to be available at Barnes & Nobles and at your local booksellers and, of course, through Amazon. And so that's Quirk, and you've got three other books as well. And the website for your site is hannahholmes.net. That's H-A-N-N-A-H-H-O-L-M-E-S dot net. And you've just got some fantastic stuff there. And check out the books at Amazon.com, at your bookstore or whatever. And, Hannah, it's just been great having you on the show. This is fascinating work. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Anytime. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.